This is content that captivates. My name is Jeff Cutler, and I have some slides. You guys are going to have some questions. You can ask at any time. Just be sure to go to the middle of the room and use the microphone there to ask your question. Hopefully, I'll be able to see you. I have a spotlight on my face, but I can see the microphone a little bit. If you're making faces at me, I can't see you, so feel free to do that. We're going to start out and talk about the content equation. You're going to learn a few things today. And the main thing about content is that it helps you reach your audience effectively when you have the right content served up in the right manner. The reason I'm here to do this is because I've been doing content for 21 years. I've been a journalist for the New York Post, the Boston Globe, NPR, Gatehouse Media, and a number of other online and traditional media sites. I also, well, I do a little writing myself. I have 21 blogs. Yeah, that's a mess. Not all of them are active anymore because I thought it's kind of stupid to spend a ton of my time doing sites like things to worry about.com, follow the tour, which I'm doing actively right now for the Tour de France, but not doing the daily posts I used to do. Every, every tour, you can go back in history on that site, every tour I would do 300 odd posts because I would do different daily results and then talk about different riders. And when you don't have money coming in for your content and that site doesn't bring anything in for me, it gets a little tedious and non-rewarding. This is my original blog, a bowl of cheese, because there's no better way to eat cheese except from a bowl. But actually that site is just a random ranting site. I talk about anything and everything on that site. Um, but it was my first foray into WordPress. And it also trained me fairly well on how to write, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I also have a gadgetreporter.com. I cover the Consumer Electronics Show every year. I have bostonfoodfan.com, I go to restaurants, I also have a food show, and many more. The, the big thing here is really to point out that I'm qualified because I've created a lot of content in a lot of channels, and it continues to work. So I'm going to share some of those secrets. It's a, a little road that we're going to go down, and I'm going to give you four things to really focus on today, or four things you're going to go away with. I'm also going to recommend some of the best blog techniques, and we might even do some creative thinking on some of your blogs, or you can catch me after. I'm covering the, I forget the name of that table, the fun table, the, the what table? The happiness table. Um, yeah, the happiness table. I already have a friend who had to go to the happiness table because he knocked his whole blog offline this morning during a session. So the happiness table did make him happy when they found it, but at the time it wasn't so great. So four things. You're going to get a bunch of info today, but the four things are why an editorial calendar is so necessary for every blog, any blog that you're doing, any content you're creating, how to quickly find free content for your blog and for any post that you're doing. There's free stuff out there, and it will bring people to your site. You can create audiences, interest in your site through this free content. The role of social media in publicizing your site and publicizing your content. And then the best way to lighten your load so that you're not doing all the writing. Now, by a show of hands, because I can probably see hands if they go up into the spotlight, how many people are blogging for their company and or their business right now professionally? How many people are in this session just because they want to know more about content? Okay, we're about equal there, and I, you'll both get something out of this. As you know, if your company has already tasked you, which I'm not a fan of that verb, with blogging, you know that content sells. And before someone's going to buy your product, they have to know about it. So your service or product has to be written about, and that falls to the half the people in this room who raise their hand because they're doing this for their company. Blogs are also, this is for the other half, an ideal way to serve up some of the information that you want to share with your audience. But before we start, we should know what content is. Content's everything. Content, if you're unaware, is anything that you serve up online, or offline for that matter. So movies, quotes, links, text posts, social feeds, curated pieces that we're going to talk about, and everything is content. And if you can find out 
through four questions. What content to create or curate or purchase, then you'll be best served to create this content. Let's go through the questions quick. First one is who are you? You have to know who you are or who your company is. You have to know who the audience is for this information. You have to know what your message is and have that determined and approved by the company. And then the best way to deliver it. And I say this, one other thing I wanted to point out that I forgot to say at the beginning. I'll give you a uh, link at the end of this so this whole PDF is already up online. You can download it at the end of the presentation. So that's in the last slide. Um, so you don't have to furiously take notes, but you can if you want. The message really matters. It's no matter how you deliver it. If you wrote messages on a postcard or sent them via an email or a, a, an online newsletter, no matter what tools you use to publicize it, the critical thing is connecting with your audience and letting them know what your content can do for them. One of my favorite slides in this presentation, although there's another one coming up, proves that engagement is not one way. You shouldn't be broadcasting your message to everyone unless that's what management has determined you should do. If you want to be a broadcast blog and not have any engagement and not be able to measure how your content reaches people and how they react or respond to it, then that's fine. Go out there and broadcast. But for the bulk of you, I think it's very important that you either gather information from your audience to find out if you're putting the right stuff up there or to find out what their response is. So think like an editor the whole time. Always think about your audience. And as we're talking about editors, let's go right into the editorial calendar phase of blogging. First thing is, you, you already have a blog. All of these things are true. You have a staff, or, or it's just you. You know what you're trying to sell or share. Hopefully you have a, an approved message that you're sharing, or at least a, a framework around that message, stuff that the company is not going to get up in arms about if you go out there and write a blog about something that you can't deliver or something that your product does that it doesn't do. And you know your audience. Every publication has an editorial calendar, whether they're a newspaper or a magazine. If, you're, if you've ever done any work in the magazine business, those publications, and they still run this way today, they're between two and four months out. So if you ran to a magazine and had a had a real close tie to an editor at a magazine and said, I need this story in next month. Well, it's too late. They have a lead time of two to four months, so you can't get anything in their publication. So when you're writing a blog, try to think in that realm. Try to plan for the entire year so that you can create content that's going to be relevant for your audience every day of the year. And it was mentioned in an earlier session about scheduling posts in WordPress. Probably the best feature that, or my favorite feature in WordPress is the scheduling. Because if I write a post today that has to do with Labor Day, I'm not gonna just send it live this afternoon. I'm gonna schedule it for September and let the thing go. But I've already taken care of that, that to-do list for September. I've already done a post that, and we'll talk about being more efficient moving forward in using scheduling and in thinking about the editorial calendar and what framework you should be using. The big thing you can do when creating content, and everyone says, where do you come up with your ideas? How do you brainstorm? How do you come up with something that's gonna be fresh every day or fresh a certain number of times a week for an audience that's, that is fleeting. You don't want them to leave your site. You want them to keep coming back. One of the best things, if you can go to Mike, I just I think the best way to create relevant content is to think about it as a topic of conversation, not push, but a topic of conversation. And you must be awesome at what you do and follow the thought leaders, the trends, and the technology. Just those, if you actually siphon it down in those three ways, just think about WordPress, thought leaders, trends, technology, boom. Or even the first post, if you had no idea what to write, frequently asked questions about your business. Yeah, I think those are up on slide 25 or 26. But yes, you're exactly right. So when you're planning content around events, think calendar. 
Think what conferences you have coming up. Think what trade shows in your industry are happening. And then think about seasonal events. If you're a, if you're a video services firm, think about the award shows. Think about major motion picture releases that you can tie a blog post to. You know far enough ahead of time when a movie is releasing that you have a month, three weeks, two weeks to write a blog post about that release and about how maybe they use certain video services in the creation of that motion picture. Tie that into your product or service and then you have a winning post. If you're a food company or a restaurant, do something around the current food trends. Do something around the wine seasons. Do something around different food festivals. If you wanted to write about food trucks in the Boston area, think about, uh, I think it's September 29th, there's a food festival down in uh, Hingham on the South Shore. So I know far enough ahead, we're only in July right now, I know a couple months ahead that I could start writing posts about that, schedule them, and have people who are rabid for that food content fed literally, or figured, literally and figuratively, with good content from that event. Some examples that I've used in the past, and I've written on technology, I've written on food, sports, all sorts of different things. I was doing some work for Nobel a while back, and they do a lot of log management, which is not an exciting topic. Log management is examining access to your information in, in a nutshell, in a simplified nutshell. I did a post on how the Tour de France is like log management. And I've done some posts for other people on how the Emmys can be like communicating with your customers. And how sustainable business is just like the food cycle. Nothing's out of bounds. And if you can deliver these posts on a regular basis, from different topics that just pop to mind. And I'll go back to the session right before lunch. What he was talking about was carrying a notebook around. I say carry a notebook around or carry your laptop around or your iPad or even a recorder, which is so old school, just to record topic ideas because that will spur you to write some more. A blog post doesn't have to be really long. We've heard a couple of people comment earlier today that a blog post can just be a line or two. When I started out, and what really trained me to write well was an experience at New England Sports Network. I graduated college and went to write sports for them. And they weren't on the air around the clock. They went off the air at 2.30 in the morning. My job was to show up at the studio at 6.30 at night and write 150 sports stories per evening between the hours of 6.30 and 2.30 in the morning. That really trains you to write quickly. And you're like, 150 stories, I'm out of here. I can't listen to any more of this, I can't do that. Everyone can do that because these sports stories were two lines to four lines of copy. That's it. It was enough to tell a story and enough to be a compelling piece of content that it was valuable to their audience and it kept them afloat until they could go around the clock. So brainstorm. Thinking ahead isn't really magic. Just, like I said, keep the notebook Ask customers what they want to read about. Ask people in your company what they are experts on, what topics they can talk about, and what they can lend to the conversation. And find out what they want to write about. This goes to one of my tips in a second. But so far, any more, any, uh, any more questions? At any time we can take them, again, just go to the microphone in the middle of the room. If you want free content, use the internet, the web, while it might not be free, it offers the tools to you that you can use to get free content. How many people in the room use um, Google Alerts? How many people of the hands raised who use Google Alerts have five alerts or fewer? How many people have six or more? I like you people the best. And the reason I like you people best is because every time I go and do a training, I'm also the social media trainer for the Society of Professional Journalists. That means I fly around to newsrooms all over the country and train reporters on how to use social tools. One of the biggest social tools I, I show them is Google Alerts. And I urge them to search for between a dozen and 20 different search terms regardless of what they do. And someone will come to me and say, well, 
I cover the environment, and I cover the environment in this podunk town for a weekly paper, and that's all I do. And I say to them, well, if you're covering the environment, you should have an alert on your name, just out of vanity and to find out every time one of your pieces goes live, if someone else stole it somewhere or is curating it, an alert on your company, which is your news outlet or your company here, an alert on the head of your company, so your president or any of your team members, alerts on all your competitors, so go get every other newspaper or go get every other company that works in the realm that you work on. Put an alert out there for every other blog that competes with the content you're putting up. Then put alerts on all the luminaries in that field. And by the end of it, you might be doing environmental reporting for a podunk weekly newspaper, but you're getting information coming in from everywhere that gives you ideas for different stories. My, the big term I use is derivative stories. What you want to do is just have your imagination sparked by different things that come across the transom and allow you to create new information for your audience. And the more creative you can be with content, the more satisfied your audience is going to be. The more satisfied your audience is going to be, if you go down the line, the more loyal they're going to be to your publications and your company, and the happier the people at the top are, and the fatter your wallet's going to get. So it, it does serve a purpose. But I really urge you to think carefully about what you have your Google Alerts set for, and then add to them. Find a, a bunch more topics. And those of you that don't have Google Alerts, you can set them up to automatically come to your inbox once a day, as they happen, once a week. And you can do it for top results or all results. It's very manageable, and it comes free from Google. And everything's just emailed to you. So you can just hit delete if you're not going to use it that day. Right now, I'm doing community management for Dell on one of their sites. And I have, I think, nine Google Alerts set up just for my minor role there. And it's just tied to every topic in technology that they want me to write about. And that comes in every day, and I can find new content every day to write on their site. So it's four or five posts a day on their site, and I'm not doing the heavy lifting. It's coming in from Google. So, I, because I follow so many bloggers, here's my question. The most successful people in the blog sphere were former journalists. So, for those of us who are not journalists, you know, for me, I, I, I do write a lot. I happen to be good at it. I have more skill than will for writing. But I, I also take on the role of a content curator, sort of like a, a person in a museum, because I'm really good at finding good stuff. But I, I, so suggestions for people who are not who are not publishers or uh, journalists. Sure, or journalists. we're going to go right into curation now. Um, the one thing I did want to show you, though, is if I can find it, is this guy right here. Atticomatic is my favorite site to share with people if you're very concerned about not being able to find enough information online. So you can type anything in, and this cute little robot will run off and find everything for you. And that's attic domatic, but you'll be able to see it in the notes as well. But if you're ever lost for a topic, or lost for stuff to jump off on, or to curate, or to build upon, just type whatever you want into the little robot's box here. And you're set. It's a search engine aggregator. It's what Dog Pilot used to be. There's another one called Duck, Duck, Go, which is a cute little duck if you're afraid of robots. But it's, they're all the same thing. It's just a, a way to let the internet do some of your brainstorming for you. Right here. Yeah, the question I have, you were talking about free content. You're not talking about borrowing somebody's article. You're not talking about copyright infringement, right? Am I? I'll, I'll answer that in like three, in three slides. We go into fair use and copyright and a few other things. As a, as a career journalist, I'm very touchy about that. But yeah, it's some people have different thoughts on curation. And to this woman's point, you don't want to steal information from people. So 
you want to curate correctly if you can. And curating is grabbing a piece of an article, linking back to the original article, finding these pieces that you know will resonate with your audience. And let me just give a, a slide on, this is the, the Dell site. If you look at these seven boxes here, the top left box is the only original piece of content on the page. The rest of those are curated pieces of content that resonate with the readers that I found through Google Alerts and that I grabbed some information and did a little commentary on them and then linked back out to the other people's site. So you're not stealing. When we go into the, the discussion of fair use, and we won't go too deep into this, but again, catch me at the happiness table and I'll, I'll talk about this stuff at length if you want. Fair use, and I was at a, an American University study this summer over at um, the Burton Center. What we determined, we had a room full of journalists, and what we had determined, which reflects pretty much how the professional content creators in this world feel, is that it's almost like pornography in that you know it when you see it. You know fair use when it hasn't stepped over the line, and you also recognize when it has. So my, my rule for fair use is sharing a certain amount of content so that you can give a commentary on it or use it to support your views and use it as an example or create a derivative work based on the original. And if you use it in that way, there's no court in the land that's going to convict you of plagiarism or copyright infringement or outright stealing. But you have to know what the rules are. And you have to be doing it in an ethical way. I mean, if you're going out there and saying, oh, this is a good article, and grabbing most of the article and slapping it down on your site and then find another one and doing the same thing, then you're no better than what the Boston Globe did two years ago to Gatehouse Media. Because what the Globe was doing was grabbing full articles, or nearly full articles, putting them on their Boston.com site before they had BostonGlobe.com. And yes, they were linking back to Gatehouse, but as anyone in the newspaper industry knows, people read the start of an article and maybe two paragraphs, maybe three if you're lucky, and then they go away. So they were getting full value of the article and the Globe was getting all the hit traffic. So to do it correctly, take a sentence or two and then do a read more and send it back to the original site. What I do over on the Dell site is I'll open a new page because I don't want to lose them from my site entirely but I think that's understood. Did you have more on fair use? Okay. Let's talk about social support for your content. Did you just got sold for $500,000? Like, no money at all, I should have bought them. Um, they were purchased this week, and they used to be the big dog in a land where you could use Reddit and stumble upon a number of other social tools to get I guess some buzz, there was also buzz.yahoo.com, I don't know if they're still around, to get buzz for your content. And it's a cool way to crowdsource and get feedback on and support for your content. If you can share your information via different social channels, that's great. And the mindset of the social set is that they get all this info online, so they're already there. Draw them over to your content by using these tools. In my opinion, Facebook is probably best because you can give more of a description of the content. You can also slap an image in there, which is fantastic. Put an image with everything that you do. Every post that you do, every, every Facebook status update, put a photo with it. It just gets eyeballs. If you're a user of Google Plus or are interested in what they do over there, I have not seen a status update over on Google Plus that doesn't have an image tied to it. And I think that was like the unwritten rule when you went over. But share links, and one big thing to focus on is how your traffic is being measured or how management is paying attention to your, your role in the company, how worthwhile the blog is to the, the very livelihood of the organization. If they're measuring traffic, then you should do all you can in every channel to go bring people back to your site. 
when I talk about Twitter and Facebook, I love to talk about this stuff because when you go there, you're like, yeah, what's that? People are talking about the food, people are just doing a status update on what they're wearing, what they're shopping, what they're doing. The cool thing about Twitter and Facebook is that people want to be the smartest person in the room all the time, so let them be. Ask them questions that lead them back to your content. You can be slightly inflammatory, but don't be over the edge. But do stuff that causes curiosity. When I was putting the, the presentation together, I came up with a phrase that I thought, well, this is a, a perfect, um, perfect status update or uh, <laughs> Twitter post to throw out there with a link to it because people would click through. I'm rethinking that a little, but I am going to read it to you anyway. It's women don't belong in technology, exclamation point, and then the link to one of my posts. Now, I'm thinking that everyone's going to click on it one way or the other, but I'm probably going to get firebombed by most of the people in the world who think that women do belong in technology, including myself. But be a little, a little driven to get people over to your site in whatever manner you can. Other great social tools for doing this and I think most of you are aware, are the groups over on LinkedIn, or the questions and answers over on Quora, Flickr, Instagram, and Storify, if you can do images or stories and link back to content that you've written or created or curated, that's fantastic. YouTube is maybe the best vehicle for getting people back to your content if you use it correctly, because YouTube, as of February, I haven't checked recently, was still the number two search engine in the world. Google is one, YouTube is number two. And it's because people go there and search for everything. So if you decide that video content, and video content is fantastic, is the best thing that you're gonna use for content on your site, cross post it over on YouTube to pull people back to the site. Go ahead. So my question is, in terms of video content, what, um, when you, if you create a video to put on a YouTube channel, what, at what minute mark do most people drop off? I was trying, I, I'm trying to figure that out. I, I think it's between I think it's three growing. and five. I think it's growing and it's also changing based on if there's an ad on the uh, video itself. But it used to be between two and five, okay. and now I think it's longer because a lot, just from my own experience, a lot of the video posts that I put up, People are hanging around. Well, what about what about Gen Yers? Because I think they have shorter attention spans. I haven't oh, gone. Well, I haven't gone that deep into the metrics. Um, we're next going to go into how we can make your job much easier. The thing I promised about free content, because right now, as the editor of your blog, you're wearing every hat in the room, unless you have a big staff. And I can't imagine that a ton of you have a newspaper-style staff of runners and copy editors and people writing for you. But you can build your team because you're built within a company that probably has people doing these roles. If you're doing all these roles, I'm sorry, uh, deal with it. But uh, you have communications and social media and marketing and advertising and everyone else. Don't forget them because everyone has a comfort level for different types of information within your organization. Similar to this crazy slide, which I don't know how it got in here, but it's the every social media tool that's out there, I think there are 600 and something different ones. Um, and there are probably more every day, and a bunch of these are already dead. But everyone in your organization knows how to share different types of content, and they have a different comfort level for each different type. I'm going to bring in Tumblr for a second, and then we'll get away from it and get back to WordPress. But Tumblr offers you a fantastic array of different ways to share information. You can just do text or a photo or a quote or a link or audio or video, or you can even do a chat now over on Tumblr. WordPress allows you to do the same thing. And if you leverage all the different types of content that people are comfortable with and leverage all the people in your organization, you come out with a winning equation. Because in 52 weeks, if you're doing two to three posts a week, and let's talk really briefly about how many posts is too many posts or too few. When you start out, don't do more than a couple a week because a couple months from now, if you started out, and maybe a couple weeks from now, 
if you started out doing five to ten posts a week, you're going to blow up and just brain freeze, and it's going to be ridiculous, and you will have overpromised your audience with content to the point where now you can only put out two a week, and they've gotten used to getting ten a week, and they will go away. And you want them on your site, so make it a slow build. Do your content building in a manner that you can realistically manage and grow on. Um, the sweet spot for a lot of my corporate blogs when I do content marketing for the big corporations, it's three to five posts a week. So if you're doing a post a day, that's plenty. People don't have a huge uh, attention span for going around and finding different things. So if you're giving them one new thing from your company per day, that's plenty. And that's something to work up to. But I would advise you to start at two a week and then go from there. But 52 weeks a year, a max of 156 posts. Okay, for one person, that's a lot. But if you have 10 people in your company, that's only 16 posts per person per year. That's a little more than one per month. And these posts don't have to be anything beyond an audio clip or a quote or a link to something that they did or a photo and then just a description. If you have 20 people in your organization and you can get a piece of content from each of them on a regular basis, that's eight posts per person per year. Have you written eight things this month? I bet a lot of you already have. So if you can get eight things per year for content from people in your organization, go do it. That makes your job really easy. Spread the workload and become an editor. Because if you don't spread the workload and you're trying to do all this work yourself, it's going to blow up. It's, it's going to be gone. The, the big thing I also wanted to talk about, and the guy over here mentioned it before, is scheduling. Think about what posts are coming up and when you can schedule them for. Because if you can start to think about different annual events, different monthly events, different trade shows, different things that you have coming up like product releases or service releases or even customer profiles, schedule those. And if you schedule one per month, if you decide to do customer profiles and do your top 10 or 12 customers and schedule them out for the next 12 months, that's one more post you don't have to write when August hits and when September hits and when October hits. So schedule that stuff. I want to talk about video only because I think it's still the most, or is now the most powerful content you can have aside from photos. If you have people who are comfortable on video and can give you video, share it. It's easy. Just record it. You don't have to be a production house to put video up on the web. It doesn't have to be long. Three to five, three to eight minutes. Longer form is working for me now, but depending on what your company does, you may only want just a commentary. You may want a two to three minute post that's just like a column. A newspaper column, if you read it aloud, reads for about two and a half to three minutes. So that might be the attention span for people who are looking for opinions. If you're not familiar with all the video sharing sites and places you can post video, there are a ton out there. I included these slides only because I do another presentation that's called 60 Sites in 60 Minutes. We really do 158 sites in 60 minutes and people run out of the room screaming. So there's a ton of stuff out there. I can share that link to the 60 sites um, presentation over at the Happiness Table as well. YouTube's the big dog. They do everything. The one thing to be sure of is if you're going to be cross-posting, make sure you focus on your branding as well. Make sure your company name is out there and prominent. Make sure you've also protected your brand and your company name across your URL, across your social sites, and anywhere that you can. Another great tool for that is Noam. If you've never been to Noam.com, they cover about 600 different social sites. You just plug your name into that little enter name here box, and it will search all those sites for you and let you know where your name has already been taken because you're sitting in this presentation and not going online to go get it. So what's next with this stuff? For good content, you have to brainstorm. You have to come up with ideas. I fully believe you have to enlist your corporate team so that everyone's involved and that you're not doing all the work yourself. You must, must, must have an editorial calendar. 
so that you know what's coming up and you're not surprised by events that come up that you didn't allocate time or effort to go cover. And then slow and steady wins the race. Don't overpromise this stuff and overpromise content. Just get out there and do it and have fun with it. Now is my uh, question slide. So if you have questions, queue up in the middle behind the microphone. And as I promised, that's my name. That's a link to uh, a site that has a bunch more blogs on it. That's my Twitter address. That's my address. Oh, and there is the link to the PDF of this presentation. My question is about uh, how often do you get your, your content stolen? And if you do, do you use uh, some sort of uh, automation tools, you know, to get removed, uh, like garlic or similar services? I really haven't tracked it, and maybe it's an artist's point of view, because if my content is good enough for someone to steal, I'm doing something right. Um, if I wanted to go all legal on someone's rear end, I could probably just manually search to see, it's out, see if it's out there. You can also, I think there are a couple tools out there that allow you to search the web for your content as well. Or I can watermark all my photos and do that sort of thing. Yes, I make my living based on being paid for content. And sure, I'd like to get paid every time it appears anywhere or every time anyone reads it. But realistically, my best effort is spent creating better content now so the next person pays me. So if, if I have a legal team, I'd have them go after it and worry about it. So maybe that's what you have your legal team do at the organization. But just be flattered. If someone likes your stuff enough to steal it, just say, well, oh, thanks. That's pretty cool. Or go over to the comments and leave a note and say, I see you found this stuff. Thanks for sharing it. So. I think you can follow all the same steps we talked about, but scale it back to the point where everything's manageable. So instead of trying to create the two to three posts a week or the five posts a week or more per week, I would focus more on marketing the blog itself and try and be strategic, maybe from the social end first and from the marketing end first, so that you have your, your presence out there more than you have your content out there and then let the content come along. I think what a lot of people have done, a lot of individual people have done, is they go out and write a book. <laughs> and then they're famous for the book, they go on writing tour, and then they just turn that book into blog posts and they already have a following. But if you're a one-person company, you have to take it a little slower and you have to be realistic. And I think scheduling plays a huge part into that as does having a good editorial calendar, even as one person. Knowing what you have due next week is very motivating. As any writer will tell you, the only reason anything ever gets written is because there's a deadline. If there's no deadline, nothing would ever get written. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, fair use in terms of video. So if you used a video, let's say you're writing a critique on something, and you brought in that video, what the rules Um, YouTube has really set things up fairly well for people not to worry about that because they allow you to embed but it links back and plays on their site. So from a fair use standard, everything's linking back to the original. It's playing from the original site. If you're talking about grabbing a video and running it on your site, you can do that, but from a fair use standpoint as a journalist, I would probably snippet it down to only a relevant portion so that you could give a critique on it or give information on it. It's the same way that a lot of the um, movie critics get away with their fair use. Yes, it's their job to talk about these movies, and yes, they work hand in hand with the movie houses, so they're, they're doing all right for themselves, and they do get some perks as far as people sending them clips and stuff like that. But it's the same rule. They can't write a whole movie and then give the critique of it. Um, it's the same way you can't publish a whole book 
in a, in a blog post and like give your opinion of the book. You have to give some relevant passages or relevant video clips. And there are tools out there, even within YouTube, or if you Google it, you can play with the embed code or play even with the, the link to YouTube where it will start and stop at a certain point. So you can lock it in to start a certain amount in and then stop so you're not even doing any video editing, you're just grabbing that portion of the video. I think we have two minutes left. Can you talk a little about developing a voice for your content? Because even though you're, you're, you may be talking on the subject, can you talk a little about developing a voice and developing a recognizable style? Sure. Depending how big your team is, and this is fairly critical because you don't want to blindside your audience once you've created uh, a follower base. But depending on how big your company is, I would say the voice goes back to a bit of the messaging and what the company's style and image is. So if you're working for a more straight-laced legal firm, you might want to have a certain writing style, a certain conversational tone that is still serious in most of its application. If you're a, doing a food post or doing a restaurant thing, a lot of your interaction with your audience comes with face-to-face -face and fun stuff in the restaurant. So I think you want to try and write in a lot more conversational tone, be a little less formal in certain ways. The, the difficult thing in creating a, a specific voice across the whole blog is if you're doing one of the things I suggested and getting content from different areas, each person in your organization is going to have a different voice. You then as the editor or as the point person should probably be writing an original piece of content pretty frequently so your own voice shows through, but then let everyone else's work towards that. If you guys have more questions, I'll be at the happiness table. Thank you for coming. And uh, <laughs> a great rest of